Hello and welcome to Monster Monday. On today's episode, I am returning to the spooky month of October for a visit to more of the undead and spooktacular creatures. I'm picking out a very tiny little dude, and this one is called the Topi. All right, honestly, I don't know if this thing's called a topi or a topi or a toppy, but um, I found this thing on D&D Beyond. Uh, it's part of the Tortle package. If you buy the Tortle package on D&D Beyond, you'll have access to this. It's spelled T-O-P-I, um, and the topi is a small type of undead. Now, what attracted me initially was the fact that this was uh, a, an older creature from 2nd edition, that was not around in 3rd or 4th, but came back in 5th edition much later. So in 2nd edition, these dudes kind of looked like scary little voodoo doll creatures or like shrunken head creatures. It immediately reminded me of the classic uh, 70s horror schlock film Trilogy of Terror. <laughs> Um, which was terrifying, and um, that's why I have this B-roll for you. But um, the modern incarnation for 5th edition, they they link it up to um, Chult and specifically to an area where there are a lot of tortles. That is why you get it as part of the tortle package. The topi were created by shrinking a corpse to a size of 2 feet tall and then cutting out their heart and replacing it with a live poisonous snake in a leather bag. The snake would stay alive without food or air and simultaneously render the topi's claws venomous. The snake would die when the topi died. These little scary creatures are in effect, I mean, when you think about like their origin with the whole poisonous snake in a leather bag thing and a shrunken corpse, it's very much like a voodoo kind of vibe to it, right? Which I think is awesome for Halloween in the month of October. What do they have? What abilities do they have? What are their stats? So they have dark vision which makes sense because they're small and D&D is riddled with creatures that can see in the dark. But as I have often come to realize that when everyone has dark vision, then nothing is special and torches don't matter and darkness doesn't really matter. So I have kind of some mixed feelings on everyone having dark vision. But these guys having dark vision is cool because then, I don't know, they're also chaotic evil, which makes sense. Now, they're, they're considered undead in terms of their monster type, which is interesting because they can be affected by spells that affect the undead. Um, why is that interesting, Bill? I don't know. Maybe it's not interesting. I just thought it was interesting because I could also see like a variant of them where they're not undead, where they're just like organically evil little monster creatures. But I do like the origin story, so we're going to stick with it. So stat-wise, they have an armor class of 13, um, not a ton of hit points, 3d6 plus 3 hit points, a movement speed of 30, despite the fact that they're 2 feet tall, which is also interesting. Um, they have damage resistance to bludgeoning damage. They're immune to poison. They have dark vision. Uh, they understand the languages that they knew in life, but they can't speak those languages, and they're considered a challenge rating of 1 half. Um, they have turn resistance, so the topi has advantage on saving throws against any effect that turns undead, which goes back to it being kind of interesting that it is an undead creature, but it's resistant to being turned. Um, so it's a little bit different from your standard skeleton or zombie in that sense. I guess this would be more like a zombie because it's a corpse that's been reanimated. Um, they have undead fortitude. If damage reduces the topi to zero hit points, it must make a con save with a DC of five plus the damage taken, unless the damage is radiant or from a critical hit. On a success, the topi drops to one hit point instead. So that's a little bit more like a zombie. Um, then their action, their attack action is Venomous Claws. They have a plus four to hit. It does 1d4 plus two slashing damage plus two uh, or 1d4 poison damage. 
and the target must succeed on a DC 11 con save or be poisoned until the end of the target's next turn. So the poison doesn't last very long. So are these a great match for a low level party? Um, yes. Absolutely. Could you throw these into virtually any encounter? Does it have to be just Chult? No. You could put them anywhere. You can come up with a backstory for why these scary little voodoo corpse monsters were made. Or who made them. Um, which I think is another interesting way to think about it too. You could upscale these pretty easily. If I was going to make these significant for a um, like mid-level party maybe... I would add damage resistance to all non-magical weapon types right off the bat. I would give them a boost to their hit points and I would double their speed. Now you're like, Bill, why would that matter? I think it would be cool to have them be really fast, like hard to catch in a sense. If you want to go absolutely batshit crazy, you can give them bat wings. So you give them a flight speed. Why bat wings? Well, I mean, if you can shrink a corpse down to two feet in size, you could probably figure out a way to necromantically sew on some bat wings. And now you have these little demon voodoo dolls with wings who could fly at you. Um, the venomous claws are pretty badass as it is. Um, but if you wanted to upscale that to mid or high level, have those claws do more damage and have the, um, the length or duration of the poison be um, until the poison is removed via a, uh, some kind of upper level spell that removes that condition. Restoration or cure poison, remove poison, whatever. So those are ways in which you can easily upscale these guys. Now, so far this has all been very encounter based. What about for an adventure? So let's go back for a second to the root of the creation of these creatures uh, because in in essence that i think that that creation story is where we get our seeds for our ideas for an adventure so who is the question who created these topies who took the time to shrink a corpse down to two feet tall and then cut out its heart and replaced it with a live poisonous snake in a leather bag and then did the room you know the the necromantic ritual to animate it who, what, what necromancer has that knowledge and power? Well, perhaps not a wizard in, in the sense of necromancy at all. Perhaps it's an evil cleric. Uh, perhaps it's even a warlock who has been granted that ability by their patron. So I would argue that you could have a couple different origin stories related to the who, but basically what we're talking about is you create a bad guy who has some kind of spell casting sort of related to necromancy, but it could even be like an invocation that you make up for a warlock. Some some kind of voodoo, you know, necromancy ability where they can make these things. And I would I would posit that this this would be something that they can make pretty easily and pretty frequently. Like maybe maybe this powerful um, you know witch doctor kind of whatever necromancer person um, could animate you know could do six of these a day let's say or whatever you know or 2d4 per day and then maybe you know by the time the parties kind of come across them uh, this this bad guy already has a couple dozen of these little minions right think of them in a sense from the bad guy's perspective as literally just that they're just minions right like they can do menial tasks they're kind of mean and nasty to each other and to anyone else, but they would never betray their creator. And the creator can give them, like, basic things to do, and they will do those things, right? And so that that could be the origin story of, of the Topi and also of the who is the big bad guy behind them all, right? Now, what is the big bad guy doing? And with that much power, why would the big, ba big bad guy need Topi as minions instead of just regular zombies or skeletons. Well, maybe the big bad guy has both. Maybe they have skeletons and zombies, and then they have the topi as well. Um, and, and maybe the topi, because they're small and fast, serve a purpose that maybe the skeletons and zombies don't serve. Um, I'm not going to say because they're more intelligent, but I'm just going to say because maybe they're more nimble. And that's where that whole boosted speed comes in. Even if you don't go with 60 speed, if you went to 40 or something, like 
give them some kind of ability um, because they do have a decent dexterity by the book so you can give them some some acrobatic ability or proficiency and you can give them a higher speed and they can kind of do some cool stuff and that could be little things like go and retrieve this or go go get that you know where they they basically go to places and they loot and they rob and they steal looking for whatever the components are that the necromancer needs um, so that's how a party of virtually any level could kind of stumble upon these things now you could then build that out from that seed of an idea you you can start off with the idea that you know that the the big bad end guy is building up kind of a, a region of power you know a lair if you will uh, and maybe that is built on some sacred uh, blasphemous site where a great ritual was done to summon some great evil power and now the necromancer has occupied that site and has started building you know a compound around it or is maybe maybe it's ruins and the necromancer is rebuilding the ruins to to bring it back to its former glory and has recruited other humans and or mortals of different races to be you know cultists and followers so it definitely has a spooktacular you know wonderful kind of halloween vibe to it that you can in integrate into your dnd campaign and again it doesn't have to be set in chult this could totally be anywhere, anywhere in your world or in any of the existing D&D worlds. Uh, it's pretty easy to integrate. Now, I will close by saying this. Could this be a campaign? Yes, you could stretch it out certainly into a campaign by making the evil bad guy with the topi um, who the party initially encounters, or maybe they just encounter the topi at low level and then at mid level they find out about the bad guy and the cult and they have to fight through and and destroy the base that I was just talking about and they fight skeletons and zombies and uh you know I don't know maybe another maybe there's like a death lock in there or something or uh you know a banshee or something that they have to fight and ultimately they fight the big bad guy and they take him down and that's when they discover that this is just one cell one just one chapter of a massive global conspiracy and that could lead to a high-level thing where the, they're, they're now tracking down these agents of this dark faction whose aim is to bring back this mega, you know, dead god um, and, and, you know, restore this dead god to it, its former glory. Actually, low-key, I just realized that I stole that idea from myself because that's kind of what I've been doing with the D&D with dads and some of the moon sea things. The Forgotten Realms has a lot of dead gods, a lot of gods who basically were there in the early days and then, you know, the, the canon lore happened and events happened and some of these older gods disappeared from the pantheons because they were destroyed during a, the Sundering or the Spell Plague or, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So I, I think it could apply to any world, really, but Forgotten Realms already has some of that built in. You can just pick out one of the dead gods. Like Moander, for example. M-O-A-N-D-E-R. Moander, the god of murder. That's a way that you can turn it into a whole campaign. So see, there we go. I still got it. I still got my touch, Karafa. Encounters, adventures, and whole campaigns. You could use these dumb little uh, voodoo doll topi to torture your players at any level and have fun with them. Maybe the topi steal something from the party that the necromancer wants and then the party wants their stuff back and they're like get back here you little scary voodoo doll and they chase the voodoo doll and they go to this grove and then like they're surrounded and you just describe how there's like these little white glowing eyes from everywhere in the shadows as the party realizes that there's like a dozen of these topi. Hmm that sounds fantastic doesn't it? So uh, that's this episode of Monster Monday. Thank you for listening and watching whatever stupidity I put on the screen because our studio is a wreck and I can't show you my gorgeously beautiful face and mustache. Um, as always, like and subscribe, or don't. I, I don't really care anymore at this point. But I hope that this was entertaining or interesting for you, and um, we will see you next week for another exciting, spooktacular creature. I haven't really decided what it's going to be yet, but... Because it's October, you can bet that it's going to be something scary. Also, postscript, I just realized as I was about to close out that I had an idea that you could take the topi and migrate it over to any horror genre game. That's right, kids. Call of Cthulhu, you bet. 
Cult with a K, sure thing. Monster of the week, hell yeah. There we go. See, flexibility. Have a great one. We'll see you next time. Bye.